Good afternoon. It's a Shan Dunn with Altair Global. Welcome and thank you for attending today's webinar, 2017 U.S. Tax and Legal Update. Before we get started, I'd like to take a minute to address a couple of housekeeping items. Altair has submitted this webinar to Worldwide ERC for one CRP recertification credit and also to the Human Resources Certification Institute for one hour of general HR credit. Both ERC and HRCI use a self-service model for submitting credit and we have included those activity IDs and instructions on how to request credit on the continuing education slide in the presentation handout sent before the webinar. If you did not receive this handout, please let us know in the question and answer window and we'll make sure you receive a copy. And there's also a slide about that in this presentation and I'll touch on continuing education credits again uh, briefly at the end of our main content. Please be advised that your phones have been muted by our phone system. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit it in the question and answer window on your screen. We'll try to respond to each question during the Q&A period at the end of the session. So on to our speaker. Our speaker, Pete Scott, is a recognized authority on relocation tax issues and brings 40 years tax law experience in both the public and private sectors to our broadcast today. We look forward to his expertise and his insight on the fluid and constantly changing tax and legal regulatory issues that could impact you, your global mobility programs, and your employees. So with that, let me pass the mic over to someone who knows way more about any of this than me, our speaker, Pete Scott. Pete? Thank you, Shan, and uh, welcome everyone this afternoon. Hopefully we'll be able to to uh, make Shan a profit and shed some light on a few things if we could move along with the slides here. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, Affordable Care Act because it's a big deal and it's going on and we should be able to follow it a little bit. Uh, and then I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on what's happening with tax reform, a couple of minutes on other legislation, and, and finally uh, some stuff on something you really should be aware of uh, that is becoming a big problem in our industry and what you can do about it. So let's move on to the Affordable Care Act. Um, you probably followed a lot of this. It's been a checkered and contentious history in the House of Representatives. Uh, the House Republican leaders uh, started off back in February uh, attempting to uh, enact a promise to repeal the Affordable Care Act uh, and replace it with something else. Um, there were a lot of fits and starts. Finally, the House leadership produced a bill was scheduled for a vote in March, uh, March 24th, uh, but unfortunately, it turned they couldn't count up enough votes to get it passed. Uh, no Democrats were going to vote for it, uh, so they needed <clears throat> almost all the Republican House members. Um, mostly, the objections came from the conservative wing of the House Republicans, so they went back to the drawing board created an amendment that satisfied the conservatives briefly that allowed the states to, to uh, <clears throat> do a bunch of stuff, as you can see on the slide, uh, on their own uh, rather than being stuck with uh, some of the uh, provisions of the old law. Uh, let's move on, Shan. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, at that point, they lost some of the centrist Republicans in the House. Um, a couple of them noted on the slide. Um, the, the, uh, the problem that they had primarily was that the bill as, as drafted uh, threatened to eliminate coverage for way more people with existing conditions than was acceptable to those folks. <clears throat> Eventually they created an amendment uh, that included eight billion in additional funding for those folks uh, from high-risk pools that the states would would uh, <clears throat> would craft. Um, that proved acceptable to most of the Republicans, but not all. So as you can see, they 
the thing squeaked by the House by four votes uh, in May. Uh, 20 Republicans voted against it, and every single Democrat. Um, it now goes on to the Senate. Um, the, in, in the Senate, there's a peculiar budget provision that allows them to pass budget legislation or some kinds of legislation called reconciliation, which we will talk about a little later on in connection with tax reform. Um, and they need 51 votes in the Senate if they use that procedure. However, um, the Senate is, has expressed, a lot of senators, even the Republican side, have accept, expressed a lot of skepticism about a lot of aspects of the House bill, uh, particularly those with concerning pre-existing conditions, uh, Medicaid reductions, which would a lot of people think is still not enough, and estimates that millions will lose insurance under the new law. Um, we are still waiting for an estimate of all of those things from the Congressional Budget Office, uh, which was due this week but hasn't surfaced yet. In the meantime, uh, the Senate is basically writing its own bill, uh, so there's really no telling what may be in the <clears throat> in final legislation. Shan? Uh, so what's in the current thing? Well, uh, there are a lot of subsidies in the ACA for individuals and families uh, that, that allow them to uh, purchase insurance uh, at a subsidized rate. Uh, those would be eliminated. Uh, subsidies would be replaced by age-adjusted re refundable tax credits. Uh, some people, mostly on the, the Democrats, certainly believe that that's not going to adequately substitute for the current subsidies. Um, individuals and employers are currently mandated to provide, to hold insurance or provide insurance, at least employers of enough people. Um, the, the House bill uh, would eliminate all of those coverage uh, requirements uh, effective uh, for last year, actually. Um, the, the individual mandates are considered important by the health insurance industry on the basis that uh, unless you have them, uh, the, the young and the healthy will opt out of the insurance pools and, the, and the, uh, will leave the, the old and the sick. Um, and insurance will become grossly more expensive. Uh, it's not too clear uh, whether employers will cut back on insurance or not, but the bill would allow them to do so. Uh, moving along, um, we also would have, there are some Medicare taxes in the ACA uh, that would be, all of which would be repealed uh, from our point of view, the ones we're most familiar with are a 3.8% tax on the investment income of high income of high income taxpayers, and an additional 9% or 0.9% Medicare tax on those folks. Um, this is a a kind of big deal. It's sort of it's a critical aspect of the Republican tax reform plans. Uh, because it eliminates around a trillion in revenue uh, that they would not have to make up for uh, in crafting tax cuts if we were, and we'll talk about that a little uh, later on in tax reform. Um, children would remain on their parents' health insurance until age 26. People with pre-existing conditions, as I said, would, would be put into these high-risk state pools and options which currently allow states to expand Medicaid, Medicaid would go away in two, after 2019. Uh, there would be uh, uh, matching funds to the states would be phased out at that point as well. And so what's going to happen next? Well, the future is really uncertain. Uh, I'm sure you all have read in the newspapers that Republican House members who went home for recent recess faced a lot of angry constituents, uh, and, and who knows how much of that is real and how much of it is 
manufactured, but clearly there is a lot of unrest and unhappiness uh, based on the fact that many fewer people would be insured and possibly at less affordable rates. Uh, as I mentioned, even the Senate Republicans think the bill is not acceptable as it's currently drafted. Uh, there is absolutely no sign anywhere of any Democrat cooperation. Uh, the only way that's going to happen is with a whole lot of changes uh, that would move farther back toward the uh, original America, uh, <coughs> Affordable Care Act. Or uh, it's possible, and there's been some movement on this toward this on both sides of the aisle, uh, it's possible there could be some movement eventually if they can't reach agreement toward some kind of uh, universal payer system that is, is common uh, in the rest of the world. But I wouldn't hold my breath on that. Um, meanwhile, the uncertainty is causing a lot of serious issues for the insurers and for the states who have to decide what they're going to do next year. Um, and that's probably not going to go away soon. Um, so there's a long road ahead. And it, this, from the Republican perspective, this has to precede uh, tax reform. And the, the reason is uh, the one I suggested earlier, uh, among others. Um, they want to get this done under the reconciliation process so they can pass it with only Republican votes. Um, and they need to repeal these ACA taxes, the 3.8%, the 0.9%, and a whole bunch of others, because they, those taxes uh, will reduce uh, will reduce the revenue baseline that they have to replace in order to make tax reform come out even. So it would give them an extra $1.1 trillion uh, to play with uh, in trying to craft tax reform that includes tax cuts uh, that are not fully paid for. So I think we have a polling question now, don't we, Shan? Uh, yes, Pete, we do. We're going to ask our audience to try to look into the future a little bit here with our first polling question. Pull that up for everybody. So we want to know what you think. Do you think companies are likely to reduce their health care plans if the AHCA passes? Your choices are yes, no, and not sure. So we'll give you a bit to answer this one, and then we're going to move on to tax reform and what's likely to happen there in the, the minds of the great prognosticators like me. All right, folks, looks like our votes are in. Give me one second to share those with everybody. Uh, this was a close one, Pete. It looks like 35... That's fascinating. <laughs> you can't get much closer than that, can you? 35% <laughs> yes. 29% no, and then another 35% for not sure. So uh, what, uh, do you have any comments on that? Well, I, I guess that, that the audience is right about where everybody else is. No one knows the answer to this question. Uh, and it's something that is of, of great concern, but it's, it's really unknowable at this point. And, and probably would depend, in addition, on what the final bill looks like. So. Uh, I think the audience is well advised to be uncertain about it. So let's move on to tax reform. We're going to talk first about, you know, about the timing and then what it might cost in terms of revenue, either plus or minus. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what's light, what is in there currently and what's likely to be in there and what might be in there and what we don't like. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how we protect uh, those provisions that are important uh, to the mobility industry. So let's first talk about the timing. What, when is this likely to happen? Um, well, the original goal um, of the Republicans who introduced tax reform uh, was to pass a bill through the House by August of 2017. Um, that is not going to happen. Um, it is now the 24th of May. There are only 40 legislative days left in Congress before the August recess. Uh, it took the House forever to work its way through uh, 
uh, health care reform. Um, the Senate is now busy with health care reform and not really spending much time on, on tax reform, which will require a great deal of senatorial time. Uh, there is no agreement uh, on the details of what should be in tax reform, even in the House of Representatives itself, uh, even on the Republican side of the House. Uh, hearings are, the slide says hearings to begin soon. In fact, the, the first hearing of the Ways and Means Committee, the very first one that they've had on tax reform, uh, despite the fact that we've been discussing it since the new administration took, took office. Um, the first hearing was held May 18, uh, that's last week, uh, devoted to general subjects. Uh, the second one, uh, which is the, those are the only two scheduled so far yesterday, uh, was on business issues, uh, particularly a House Republican proposal for a border adjustment tax, uh, which I'm, I'm going to discuss a bit later. And of course, in the middle of the House deliberations, uh, President Trump tossed a one-page list of tax reform suggestions into the process, which caused some delay in and of itself. So what is the new goal? Well, we have a new goal. Uh, the new goal is on the next slide. The end of 2017. Um, that goal, too, is a bit doubtful. Um, as yet, there is no legislative language in either the House or the Senate. Um, and all of that would have to be completed, debated, um, discussed and so forth. Um, so if they get and if they pass it at the end of 2017, the best guess is it would have to be effective not until 2018, uh, presumably with any number of transition rules that would extend the, the true effective date for various provisions out somewhere into the future. Uh, all over the, the Hill, uh, organized groups from every business and individual sector uh, are now busy weighing in uh, with their own proposals, their own objections, uh, their problems, what they need done, what they don't want done, uh, including us, by the way, uh, the mobility business. Um, and that can, can take forever uh, to get the, the the members to actually coalesce around something that, that they can agree with. It, it's, it's about who's going to suffer the pain and how much pain. Um, it, uh, in fact, I got the tax reform is sometimes thought of as a lawyers and lobbyists relief act because it really creates a lot of business for those, those of us in that business. Anyway, at this point, it's not really clear whether the end of the year is even realistic. Uh, and if, if it is, um, the, the, um, we've, got to, we've got to figure out what is this going to cost when we actually create tax reform. And I think we have another polling question on that subject. Right, you are, Pete. This is another one we're going to ask you uh, your thoughts and kind of look into the future a bit. Pulled up for everybody. How likely do you think it is that Congress succeeds in passing major tax legislation this year? Choices are very likely, pretty likely, not very likely, and not sure. For the record, I personally checked not sure, but, I, but I'll be interested to see what the audience actually thinks about this. And here we have the results. <laughs> I like the very likely 0%. <laughs> I can't say I'm very surprised by these, Pete. Uh, so for everyone on the phone, I, I think the results of this poll kind of reflect uh, the general feeling out there that that there's there's probably more smoke than fire at the moment. But you never know; uh, things could come together, and they could all gather around the fire and sing "Kumbaya" and get it passed this year. So we not we don't know, but but obviously most of you think it's either not very likely or you're not sure. So let's move on to what ta ta or tax reform might cost if they actually get around to doing it, which is a key impediment actually to producing tax reform. Now, could we get to the next slide, Shan? Um, 
There we go. No. Nope. Hit a bad button. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, the original goal of the of the House Republicans and the administration was to have revenue neutral tax reform. What that means is that whatever they do to the tax code, tax cuts, tax increases, and so forth have to balance out so that you raise the same revenue as the old code. Uh, unfortunately, that's not possible under either the House Republican or the Trump plans that have been introduced so far. Uh, the business cuts, as the slide says, lose trillions of dollars. Uh, the House has a border adjustment tax in its proposal that would raise a lot of money, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> but it is losing a lot of ground. There's a lot of opposition in the Senate. The administration is not on board either. It's said to favor tariffs on imports. Um, the, the House Republicans also have a proposal for full expensing of business investments by you know the, the buying of capital assets, but with the offset of no interest deductions at all uh, for businesses. Uh, and that too would lose a ton of money, but is also losing ground. Uh, at yesterday's hearing, even some Republicans said they didn't support either the border adjustment or the lack of an interest deduction. The, the problem with the interest deduction piece is that that there, a lot of investment is already written off very rapidly. Small businesses get expensing, uh, wouldn't so this wouldn't help them you know, except to eliminate their interest deductions. Um, big businesses get to accelerate their depreciation, uh, and the interest deduction for businesses relied on very heavily on a lot of businesses for obtaining growth capital. So it's not clear that any of that is going to happen. So with those revenue raisers kind of off the table, we're looking at a very large uh, potential uh, deficit. Uh, let's move on. In fact, the, the numbers, the way the numbers are right now, it would be impossible to make up that difference. Um, even if you knocked out every single deduction in the tax code, um, and you also need that $1 trillion from the repeal of the ACA taxes to fund tax cuts. <coughs> so uh, let's move on, Shane. So the, the bottom line is uh, we are looking at uh, a fairly high apparent cost. Now let's, let's talk about something called reconciliation, because that also factors into how you figure out what the cost is. It's a peculiar Senate budget rule. In the Senate, most legislation requires 60 votes to pass. You know, currently, the Republicans have 52 votes. So they cannot pass legislation by themselves. Uh, however, there is a procedure called reconciliation, which allows some, budget, some legislation that affects the budget to be passed with, a, with just a majority. Um, but it, the kicker is it can't include any budget costs beyond a 10-year window. Um, the Republicans want to use reconciliation for both ACA and tax reform. Um, but these huge costs that, are, that we're looking at, uh, potentially, uh, won't allow those reconciliation procedures to be used, which would mean they'd have to have Democrat votes to pass legislation unless the tax cuts are temporary. That is, they'd have to expire after 10 years because otherwise uh, they, they create costs beyond 10 years. Uh, the, um, one of the themes voiced persistently at both of the hearings Ways and Means has had so far is the undesirability of temporary tax cuts. You know, businesses and individuals both uh, want and need certainty as to what the tax burden is going to be into the future. Uh, this was a this is the, the reason the original Bush tax cuts were made temporary. They didn't have enough votes to pass them otherwise. Um, and in fact, the Joint Tax Committee, which does cost estimates for Congress, uh, has said if they if the business tax cuts are left the way they are. <coughs> 
they could only be effective for three years before they would have to be uh, be sunless, sunsetted, and start over. So uh, we the reconciliation procedure itself is creating some issues in how to design tax reform. So how do we determine what it costs? Well, there is a traditional method, which is called static, as you look at the slide. And what you do there is you try to figure out what the impact is on people who are actually affected. For example, what is it? What's the saving from eliminating the mortgage interest deduction, and how how many people are taking that, and how much money would it save if they don't? Uh, there's an alternate method called dynamic, uh, which is much more complicated. And what you do there is you try to attempt to calculate what the effect of all of the changes together are on the economy as a whole. Um, and both methods currently uh, are required uh, in congressional budget estimates. So the people that do the estimating have to use both the static method and the alternate and the dynamic method. Typically, uh, dynamic scoring results in a lower cost uh, because there is an assumption that if, if the legislation involves tax cuts, there will be enough of a stimulus to the economy to increase revenue to make up for some of the losses from the, uh, from the, from the cuts. So um, how do we get there? Uh, well, we have both government and outside groups who do cost estimate. For the government, the Treasury Department has a, depart a division that does that. The Joint Tax Committee does it. The Congressional Budget Office does it. Uh, there are a bunch of outside think tanks and other groups that also contribute uh, their own estimates based on very sophisticated estimating mechanisms. The giant accounting firms do that also. Um, unfortunately, you have to take all that with kind of a grain of salt, at least the outside ones. They all have, they're all very good, but they all have some political leanings of some kind, some lean left, some right. There are some centrist ones. Um, and that, that leaning tends to affect the estimates because the estimates require uh, all kinds of assumptions as to the behavior of people, what, what they're going to do, how the economy is going to grow, and so forth. So you will see lots and lots of competing estimates as to what some of this stuff's likely to cost. But for right now, uh, the bottom line is that, the, that, neither, that what's on the table is not really detailed enough for anybody to do uh, much more than a kind of back of the envelope calculation. But all of those, no matter which leaning you get from the estimator, uh, seem to indicate a pretty significant loss. Uh, currently, the administration is saying the economy will grow at a fast enough pace to make up for those revenue losses. But in order to do that, uh, they have to assume a growth rate of 3% plus. Uh, currently, we're at about 2%. 3% plus would be high even by historical standards. For example, it would be higher than the rate of growth right before the uh, last recession. So uh, suffice to say that the, the economics community, as in general, doesn't think that growth rate is very likely, although Obviously, economists can be found who do think it's, it's doable. So where that leaves us is that revenue neutrality, as we think of it, is probably not going to happen. Uh, we're going to be looking at, at tax cuts of some kind, uh, possibly temporary, and probably unpaid for unless uh, the economy grows at a, a hitherto unprecedented so we now get to another polling question. I'm not going to predict this one. We want to know, would you be in favor of tax cuts whether or not they are paid for? Your choices are yes, no, or it depends on how big the added deficit will be. We all want a tax cut, Roy. All right, Pete, here's our results. 12% yes, 31% no. And for our majority, 58%, it depends on how big the added deficit will be. So what are your thoughts on that? 
uh, it seems to me that that's a very that's very consistent with what most of the public polling says. Um, uh, the the majority wants to know how much it's going to cost <laughs> before they sign on. Um, uh, there are a substantial number of, of uh, taxpayers who think that, that they want re true revenue neutrality and some who, who are not that concerned about that. So this is very, very, uh, very consistent with what uh, public polling uh, has shown. So we're going to now move on to what, what actually is in the stuff that they're talking about. Um, and as you see, it's not clear what's in there, but we're going to talk about it anyway as though it were clear. We have, what we have on the table currently is a House Republican blueprint that was produced in June of 2016 by the House Republican leadership. Uh, it has a broad menu of both individual and business tax changes that are pretty much uh, described in general without a whole lot of specifics. Uh, and then in April, President Trump uh, released a one-page uh, set of rather broad proposals that has way less detail even uh, than the House blueprint does. So let's go on to see what's in the House blueprint briefly which is, by the way, the basis upon which they are going to be discussing uh, tax reform in the various hearings that they're uh, holding. So we, the tax rates would be reduced to three. There are, I think, seven now. I'm not, it's not clear how much simplification that creates, since it's not too hard to figure out what the tax rate is. But, but they would be lower, uh, and that's the important thing, 12%, 25%, 33%. Unfortunately, the blueprint doesn't tell us what income each of those rates would apply to, so which uh, hampers the cost estimators somewhat. Um, standard deduction would be roughly doubled uh, to 12,000 for singles and 24,000 married, uh, but without any personal exemptions. So uh, it would move a lot of itemizers from the uh, from itemizing to taking a current deduction and certainly would simplify filing considerably. Um, Blueprint says that it would eliminate deductions. It doesn't really specify which ones, but it does say it would retain the charitable contribution deduction, uh, some form of the mortgage interest deduction, and some form of the exclusions for employer-provided health insurance and retirement savings. Nothing about, for example, what happens to the various fringe benefit exclusions, business expense deductions, and so forth. Um, on the subject of retirement savings, which is actually quite a, a costly thing because there are a lot of tax breaks for money that's contributed to retirement plans. Um, the administration was recently reportedly considering a proposal to eliminate the tax breaks for retirement savings. You'd get no deduction currently or exclusion for contributions. What would happen is that, that all of those would be after tax, but all of the withdrawals later would be like Roth IRAs, no tax on money you take out of, of contribution of retirement plans. This is In the tax community, this is referred to as the Rothification of retirement. So um, what about the business side on, uh, or what about the rest of the House Republican blueprint? Sorry, I missed one. Um, capital gains, dividends, and interest would remain taxable, uh, but there would be a 50% deduction. So at the three rates they specified, you would have effective tax rates of 6%, 12.5%, and 16.5% uh, on, <clears throat> on those items. Um, this is a capital gains and dividends already have a special tax rate, but this is a really big deal for interest because interest income is currently taxed at the wage income rate and would now go down to either 6, 12 and a half or 16 and a half percent. Uh, the alternative minimum tax would be repealed. Uh, there's a lot of cheering about that one actually. Just about everybody hates the AMT, but <laughs> 
Now, there are a lot of objections as well because repeal primarily favors uh, upper income taxpayers and kind of further skews the, the tax paying uh, uh, effect downward. Uh, for example, you may remember uh, that a while back there was a, a leak of part of President Trump's 2005 tax return. Um, and it revealed that in 2005 he paid $38 million in tax. However, $31 million of that was alternative minimum tax. So if, and you, there's a similar effect in a lot of very high income returns. Uh, if, if you repeal the alternative minimum tax in that year, he's paying tax at about a 6% effective rate. So that's what the objection is to elimination of that. Estate and gift taxes repealed, and as we've discussed, the ACA taxes repealed. So what about business? Um, the House Republicans would like to cut the corporate rate to 20%, 35%. There is, in fact, broad agreement, I think, in both parties, really, that the, the corporate tax rate is too high. It, it tends to make our companies less competitive uh, in world business, so uh, there, there is some some possibility of a coalescence of opinion around that. Um, a somewhat more uh, controversial provision that would pass, pass, tax the business income of pass-through owners at 25 percent rather than individual tax rates. What that means is that uh, sole proprietors and, and uh, LLCs and so forth would get, would get a lower tax rate uh, immediate write-off of all capital interest investment, but no interest. We talked about that. Uh, a one-time repatriation of uh, untaxed foreign earnings uh, that is uh, would raise a lot of money over a, over a short period of time. And then there is a border adjustment, which is the most controversial part of the blueprint. Uh, what would happen there is that exports wouldn't be taxable. The imports would, would have a tax of 20% on top of whatever they were was paid for them. And if a business was using imported parts to build something else, those costs wouldn't be deductible in calculating the taxable income. Uh, it raises a lot of issues, uh, including how you calculate it, enforcement, uh, and it has a pernicious effect on some industries, retailers, for example who import a lot of the stuff they sell, uh, but it does raise a lot of money because we currently import way more than we export. Uh, there was a lot of opposition, as I noted at the hearing yesterday. Um, what about the Trump plan? Well, Trump has a similar, somewhat similar to the House on the in individual side and similar to his campaign plan. You know, we got three individual brackets, slightly different from the House. Again, no income levels specified. Um, standard deductions like the House uh, it says it's going to eliminate tax breaks except for protect home ownership and charitable gift tax deductions. Uh, no telling what that really means. And again, repeal the ACA high income taxes, the alternative minimum tax. Uh, nothing about capital gains, dividends or interest, no idea what, what tax of those would look like. Uh, on the business side, uh, we'd have, uh, again, uh, taxing business income of pass-throughs at 15% instead of 25 as on the House bill, uh, and a low tax for repatriation like the House bill, uh, but nothing on the border adjustment, full expensing, or business interest, or anything else. So some, there are a lot of sources that suggest the administration is not in favor of any of those. Uh, they've actually floated a, a time or two the notion of, of a value-added tax, and the president himself reportedly favors some form of tariffs on imports rather than a business adjustment tax. Um, so what how's, how's this affect mobility issues? Well. Uh, Nothing is specific here, but as you can see on the slide, we have a number of, of deductions and tax breaks that are important to our industry. Uh, 
the moving expense deduction, the capital gains, home sale exclusion, mortgage interest, and so forth and so on. State tax, income and property tax, um, state income and property tax deductions, and the foreign earned income and housing exclusions are the most prominent. Um, so what do we do about those? Well, the, the mortgage interest deduction is rather well defended. Um, both, the, both the Trump and House plans say they're going to retain some form of interest deduction. Uh, NAR and others spend tens of millions lobbying that issue. Uh, it undoubtedly will be well defended. And so, and so, so the wholesale cap gains exclusion. Uh, state and local taxes, the states and numerous others lobby extensively and, and so on for the foreign earned income and housing exclusions. So while we support, while we at Worldwide ERC support those provisions, uh, we simply offer our support to the other people working on them <clears throat> rather than spending a lot of time on them ourselves. What we focus on uh, is the moving expense deduction and exclusion. Uh, which is a somewhat lower priority for those other organizations. And so ha ha historically, uh, Worldwide ERC and AMSA uh, have to carry the ball. Uh, in interestingly, the moving expense deduction was last changed in 1993. So it's been in the code since 1960s and not touched since 93. So we have a, some work in educating people as to why it matters. So what are we doing? Well, uh, we've got those two industry groups working hard to put together supporting materials, white papers, statistics, uh, <clears throat> developing some congressional supporters. And recently, we commissioned an update of an economic study from 1993, uh, which is still very good, but just outdated. Um, it's um, it's called if we could get to the go on to the next slide, um, the tax treatment of moving costs, the impact, the economic impact on a growing economy. Um, this was done by a couple of well-known tax economists back in late '92, uh, and their conclusion is just as valid today. It's, the conclusion is based on all kinds of study and analysis that mobility of labor is critical to economic health, the health of the economy. And the moving expense deduction contributes importantly to that labor mobility. Uh, the new one should be completed in June sometime, and we will make it available to members. And we're also working on grassroots efforts, which we'll be, you'll be hearing about uh, sometime in the near future. So I think we have one. Is this our final polling question, Shan, I believe? Yes, there is, Pete. Let me open that up for everybody. Okay. Do you think your company would be willing to write letters to their Congress members supporting the moving expense deduction? Your choices here are yes, no, not sure, and not sure, but would be willing to ask. This will be a very interesting set of answers. hope we get lots of yeses. Oh. That's very there. That's very good. Thirty-six percent yeses. Go ahead, Shan. You get to read the. You get to read the results. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Pete. Uh, our results for this poll: thirty-six percent yes, eight percent no, sixteen percent were not sure, and our majority, by just a slim margin, forty percent were not sure but willing to ask. So, would you like to chime in, Pete? Well, I think that's a really encouraging number. I mean, we've got 76% who are either yes or are willing to go find out, and another 16% who are just not sure. So I, I think that's encouraging from the standpoint of developing some grassroots support for our efforts. So that's our, that's our discussion of tax reform. Now we're going to move along to one other minor legislative thing. Well, not really minor. Uh, we've been following this Mobile Workforce Act for about eight years now. It's been introduced seven times now. And what it would do was would create one nationwide standard for when workers start to be taxable in a state other than where they live. And it would affect all of our people that are on temporary assignment somewhere or briefly in another state. Um, right now, every state has its own rules. 
uh, under this act, uh, if it ever passed, the, the state wouldn't be able to tax anybody unless they were there for at least 30 days. Um, it, it has actually passed the House last year, and it has passed the House Judiciary Committee this year already. It has over 40 bipartisan sponsors in the Senate. Uh, we've been pushing for it for a long time. It looks like it might finally be reaching the goal line, and we would certainly uh, be applauding if that happened. It's conceivable if we have tax reform, it could get attached to that. So that's legislation. The last thing I want to talk about is some, a subject uh, you may not hear much about, but it's a pretty big problem uh, in our business and growing and can hurt you big time. Um, the problem, we refer to it as wire fraud. Uh, and what that means is that increasingly we are seeing instances where uh, hacked or compromised email is used to send fraudulent wiring instructions uh, or redirect closing funds, transferee equity. Uh, that is, people who have, who have found, gotten enough data to manage to convince you that when they tell you to, fraud, to wire the wire funds to somewhere, that, it's, that you should go ahead and do it. Lots of losses in recent years. Uh, it's an increasing problem. Uh, the title companies and the closing folks particularly have been affected. But sometimes transferees can get affected by this as well. So what happens here? What's, what's actually going on? Well, um, what, what usually happens is someone, some person intent on fraud, manages to get enough detail about a transaction or the participants to impersonate uh, a participant in the transaction. Uh, hacks into the email of the, of the buyer, the seller, a real estate agent or somebody else uh, manages to get enough details uh, uh, of, a of the transaction uh, to convince somebody holding funds that a request is legitimate to have those funds wired to a fraudulent account or to a debit card. Uh, home sales, relocation home sales can also be a target. Um, the, typically happens is that, that, uh, that the perpetrator uh, manages to get enough information on the sale price, dates, bank information, equity amounts, and so forth to, be, to pretend to be the transferee. Uh, that person then sends instructions to the RMC as to where to send the equity. Uh, if you're not on your toes and you simply follow those instructions, uh, somebody is going to be out a very large amount of money because that money is not going to wind up in a transferee bank account. It is going to wind up uh, in the hands of someone who impersonated the transferee. So there's a, a bunch of do's and don'ts here. Uh, how do you avoid this kind of thing? The main thing to remember is uh, don't just assume that something you get by email or text uh, or, or even by mail uh, as an instruction is valid. The way to avoid this problem is always to check back. Uh, we call that a two-factor ID. Um, if, if you get a an email saying, I want my wire transfer sent to blah, 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 and it appears to be from the transferee, or it appears to be from the, uh, from the buyer of the, of the house out, uh, or the seller of the house, um, pick up the phone. phone. Phone somebody that you know is valid and ask them if that's correct. Uh, or get some other secondary confirmation from the transferee or some other party who should know what they're talking about. Do not simply wire money or send money based on a single communication from someone purporting to be uh, the, the person to whom the money is supposed to be sent. 
one of the important aspects of this is to make sure transferees and staff and suppliers are aware of this problem. Um, some companies explain wire fraud in their initial relocation packages to explain to transferees why they should be careful about their accounts, uh, why they should be careful about giving information to other people, and why they may be getting follow-up phone calls about stuff that they thought they'd already taken care of. And it is important to make sure that suppliers uh, are doing cybersecurity due diligence. Um, transferees should be advised to, to not use uh, uh, unsecure email, Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, that kind of stuff. Um, those are the kinds of accounts that are rather easily hacked and, and uh, taken over and where information is not secure, and you need to be careful about that. And finally, a lot of this stuff comes from, I mean, it will come with logos and letterheads and, and information that looks absolutely legitimate. It looks absolutely like what you would expect to get from XYZ Realty Company or XYZ Bank. But don't assume just because it does that it's real. Uh, sometimes it's not real. The best defense is always to check, check up and make sure and not get yourself uh, in a position where you're out thousands of dollars with, with uh, potentially no recompense. So uh, that's my spiel for today. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left for questions, do we not, Chan? Yes, we do, Pete. I'll get to those in just a second. Uh, before we do, I just want to touch on our continuing education credits. Uh, here on the slide, you can see the uh, activity ID number and the instructions for how to apply for credit for both worldwide ERC for the CRP credits and for HRCI for the human resources credits. Uh, these are reflected in the presentation handout that you should have seen before the webinar. So if you don't have that for reference, uh, please let us know here at Altair, and I will make sure to get a copy of the presentation to you so you have access not only to these uh, continuing education credit numbers, but also to piece information as well. So with that said, let me get over here to our question and answer window and see what I can pull up. All right, Pete, it looks like we've got a couple here. We'll get to them, uh, to as many of them, rather, in these last five minutes as we can. I'm going to paraphrase here. Uh, this audience member, as I understand, NAR and others are not happy with individual tax proposals on the table, uh, even if they retain the mortgage interest deduction. Why would that be? Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question that, that, uh, that relates to the dynamic uh, between enhanced standard deductions uh, and and itemized deductions uh, and the effect of lower tax rates. Uh, the mortgage interest deduction uh, is highly is somewhat concentrated in the mid to, mid to upper level, but a lot of it is in the middle class uh, deduction area. Um, the, what NAR worries about and others is um, if you greatly expand the standard deduction and you reduce the tax rates, um, then A, you are going to have a lot of people who, who do not benefit, either do not benefit at all uh, from the mortgage interest deduction because they no longer, their itemized deductions are no longer higher than their standard deduction. Uh, or because the lower tax rate that applies uh, makes their mortgage interest deduction uh, less valuable. Uh, as a result, uh, they worry that the mortgage interest deduction will in general be less valuable and therefore uh, there will be less mortgages and so forth. In fact, uh, they just published a study that they had commissioned from PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, that suggested that even if the mortgage interest deduction is retained, uh, 
uh, they think housing prices might decline by around 10 percent uh, because of these other related provisions, which is obviously why they are concerned about that. It also suggests, I think, to me that that they're pretty sure they're going to be able to retain all or most of the current mortgage interest deduction, and they just want to make sure that it's as effective uh, as it always has been at promoting uh, home ownership. So that's that's a long answer to that question. All right, Pete, by my clock, we've got time for one more, and then we'll wrap up. So, uh, okay, what would tax reform mean for home sale programs? Would their tax treatment change? Oh, you know, that's a really interesting question. You know, we, we have for many years uh, operated home purchase, bought and sold homes from transferees without having to pay tax on the amounts that we, that we incur disposing of the house. Uh, interestingly, those provisions don't depend on the statutes. There's, there's not a, a particular tax code provision uh, that that either allows those or talks about them at all. It's a, a, an internal revenue service uh, uh, interpretation of, of the tax code. Uh, nothing that I know of in tax reform uh, that's on the table now would have any impact uh, on, those, on those conclusions. Um, the IRS rulings that are that are in place now would still remain in place, and it looks to me like our home sale programs uh, at least uh, would be unaffected uh, by tax reform, although stay tuned. That's it, I guess, Shan, right? Uh, right you are. Hello, everybody. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, interesting and extensive information, uh, information pardon me, uh, that we discussed today, and we do want to honor our time commitment to you and keep you only for the allotted time. So we're going to start our wrap-up. Uh, I would like to say any questions that come in as we're wrapping up that we didn't get to answer, uh, those are tracked in the GoToWebinar system. I can get those over to Pete and get an answer in writing out to you. Uh, before we close, I would obviously and especially like to thank Pete for doing the research and compiling this information and uh, getting it together so that uh, we could present it to you today. I know that was a lot of work, so thank you for that, Pete. And for taking and thank you for taking the time to share it with us. I would like to also thank our corporate members of our audience uh, that have attended today. And as a token of our appreciation, you will be receiving a $5 gift card uh, for attending this afternoon's webinar. We recognize that your time is valuable here at Altair, so from all of us here, we want to thank you again for attending, and have a great afternoon. Have a good day, everybody.